Okay. Hey, you guys. Whoa, we're right on time. Bam! 10 a.m. came, and we are here. And thank you guys for joining us. I see some of you guys out there. Hit the uh, like button. That somehow lets YouTube know that we're live, and we got a cool show, and you're going to like it. You know you're going to like us. You might as well like it right now. And uh, we're going to bring our favorite guest on in just a second. I'm going to do my little intro stuff that I do every time. And I hope you guys are doing well. So put in the chat where you are. Errol. Yes, I'm in the business of storytelling. That's your motto. Cool. Where are you from, Errol? And, and tell us where you guys are in the world. We'd love to see that. That we are broadcasting all over the friggin' place. This is cool. Okay. Spoken. Hey, howdy. Well, I'll go ahead and get, let's get the party started. So I'm Mark Silber. I'm an author, educator, photographer. I have a lot of hats. And Carmel, California, just a stone's throw from where both Edward Weston and Ansel Adams lived and photographed, had wonderful houses and studios. Really, I could practically throw a rock there and hit it. On the other side, I could hit a, throw a rock and hit where Clint Eastwood has it's called Mission Ranch. Pretty cool spot. So we're in a very creative area here. Sometime you guys should come and visit. But I want to just let you know that our sponsor here, Bay Photo Lab, has got some specials. And you know my motto is getting prints. Get them made. These guys will help you make prints. 10% off on all frame prints. I don't put prints up without being framed because it just finishes them and makes them look good. And you can get 10% off on frame prints, the way to go. Thin wraps, these are cool. You can see them. They, those, those are another way to go. If you don't want a frame, you can just put that on the wall. I have one of those. They're actually pretty cool. And here's the real deal, you guys. 20% off on Tango drum scans. Tango scanning is actually really super high quality. Dan might have even used these. Um, 20% off. Find your best negatives. Send them off carefully to Bay Photo Lab, or better yet, drive them there. And, and you'll get a beautiful scan, super high res. And my philosophy about scanning is I'm going to scan a print, I mean a negative or a slide. I want it to be the highest quality I can get, so I recommend that. 25% off on your first order always, so after the show, go over there and order some. Okay, without further ado, all the way from New Mexico, Dan the Man Milner in the van. Dan and the Man Milner. <laughs> I'm here. You're I'm, here. I'm in a frozen van. In we can tell. Storm. And the, um, the van is not moving today by the looks of it. And uh, it started snowing in the middle of the night, and it's going to snow much of the day. And, uh, yeah, so my plan to be in, in town in front of my laptop is uh, out the window. Well, <clears throat> I mean, <laughs> you do look cold out there. And, and I, a moment ago, I could see the snow out the window. So we could use, down. We could use some of that moisture in California. Flakes. Yeah, you know, it's weird. I, I thought winter would be a real challenge for me after so many years in a in a temperate climate, but I, I actually, it's um, one of my favorite seasons. Yeah, I hear you. Well, let's, why don't we dive? Uh, before, before you get too far, I think, oh, yes. uh, Mark, I forget. You, could, you could turn, uh, oh yeah, that as well. Yeah, I want to remind you guys to subscribe and enable the bell, and you'll, don't miss any of our shows, and Jared, yes, you were saying? Um, you could either probably turn Dan up a little bit, uh, and maybe you down just a little bit, Mark. Okay. Uh, just so that we have a comfortable interview for everybody. I'll turn me. Dan, I've already got up all the way. So okay, they, then I turn you down just a little bit, and okay. that should be good. I'll pull me uh, down. We should be good to go. Okay, well, Dan, our topic for today is storytelling with your camera, right? So this is something we've talked about before, but as we were talking before the show, I don't think you can talk about this enough. And you are the guy that's turned on a lot of people to storytelling with their cameras. So what what's up? What do you got to say about this? Yeah, story. Um, also sometimes referred to as narrative form photography. 
Um, it's not better than any form of other form of photography. I mean, I think a lot of people like to just walk around and look for individual images and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. I think for whatever reason, for me, I was bent on doing narrative work from the day that I picked up the camera. And I think that ties to the fact that I was writing before I was making pictures. And so I was always writing stories. And when I picked up a camera, it felt like a way of, of just visually telling a story as opposed to written. Am I hung up a little bit? A little bit. It's still going. Yeah, but you know, I think you're back again. I think we got most of it there. It's your your uh, you know maybe the snow is interfering with the bandwidth. It's, it's possible taxing the yeah. internet. Yeah, I think I made a list of things that I think are helpful when you start thinking about doing stories with a camera. Yeah, and um, it's a very different way of working. It's it's uh, it takes a little practice. It takes patience. It takes a lot of time. And I think that's why sometimes it, it turns some people off because just the time required to do this. But I've got a, I've got six, uh, six or seven points here that we can go over that I think would be good things to keep in mind. I love it. If you want me to start on those. Bang away, man. Let's hear those six or seven points. All right. Number one um, is number one for a reason and cannot be uh, understated, if you will. Um, and that is to find your story. I often get questioned by people. I literally will have people send me an email or a text or a message or something, or comment on YouTube and say, tell me what to photograph. And that's a very, I, I understand partly where that might be coming from. It's a very bizarre question for me because I'm, I have a list of stories a mile long that I'll probably never get to, even if I, the best case scenario, if someone just came to me and said, I'll fund you for the rest of your life, you don't have to work, all you have to do is go do these projects, I probably wouldn't finish all of them and I keep adding to the list. But the easiest thing to think about is when someone asks me what to photograph, I basically just say, well, who are you? Like, what do you, what do you believe? What do you think? And how do those beliefs and feelings make you make you feel? What do they make you do? What do you love? What do you what agitates you? What do you think about before you go to sleep at night? What's the first thing you think about in the morning? Those are good clues to finding what your story is. I think literature is another. I think music is another. I think current events, depending on the style of photography you want to do. Uh, I know a couple of folks who are in the trenches in the Ukraine right now. Uh, photographers who are over there, which has got to be a challenging oh, and potentially very, very dangerous place. If there's a, if, you know, if the match is lit, you know, these guys are caught in the trenches and I don't think anybody's going to be stopping to, um, you know, say, Hey, you're not a, an enemy combatant. They're just going to be shooting at everything and everyone. So, yeah. you know, depending on the kind of thing, but finding your story is really the key. That's point number one on that. Note, this is a good place for your notebook, right? You can sketch this stuff out. You can you can even make kind of a little storyboard. Yeah. Use your notebooks, you guys. That helps you cl clarify what like those points Dan made. What what am I all about? What interests me? You can you can draw or you can do what you did. Is that a little uh Instax photograph or what? Yeah, these are images that were made with a Polaroid. Sorry, here images made with a Fuji camera, but yeah. then I printed them out by Instax. Yeah, they cool. were from last week's uh, trip to Baja. Nice. Okay. Okay. Point number two, and this is directly tied to point number one, is once you've found your story, then reduce it. Reduce it to the smallest possible form of that story because most often that means that you're going to have a smaller area to cover. You're going to have less people to cover, but oftentimes those microscopic stories are capable of telling a much broader story, but in finite form. And the best example I can give you is when I was in college photos, I was in photo school in like 1990, 1991, 92, and there was a photographer, I want to say at the time, he might have been out of Pittsburgh, but I can't remember. His name was Jim Hubbard. 
and Jim Hubbard did this thing called shooting back where he went into inner city neighborhoods and he gave cameras to kids. He was the first person I, in my recollection that ever did this. This project has been cloned, stolen, copied a zillion times since then. But Jim was, was a newspaper photographer and it was in his, it could have been Chicago. It could have been, it was a, somewhere in the Midwest or the Northeast. And he went into these neighborhoods and gave kids cameras. And it was really the first time that they ever had a voice and a, 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 like a voice that would go out into the world. And that ticked off, not ticked off, that kicked off a lot of people talking about homeless situations in America. So by the time I come to photo school in 90, 91, 92, there's a lot of documentary and photojournalism students who are like, I'm gonna do a project about homelessness in America. And, you know, that's a huge story. However, there's probably someone within you know a few miles of your house that's homeless and that one person is representative of the entire story yeah so it's one you know if i said i'm going to cover homelessness in america that's a multi-year yeah. project at at the least and so but i know there's a guy living under a bridge on the santa fe river i know because i've seen him and i've talked to him a bunch of times that guy's representative of all of it Right. And so I can just go and spend as much time as possible. So reduce that story as much as you possibly can, because it just makes the story much more doable. And also, it's just easier for people to relate to, to the overall project. Good point. Absolutely. Are you ready for point three? I'm ready for three. You look ready. I'm ready for three. You guys ready out there? I think we're ready. OK, we're going to be um, we're, we're listening. Point number three is figure out what your goal is with the project and work backwards from the goal is your, and, and there's, I want to break this in half. I want to break this for in half for half of the people who just want to make pictures and are not professionals and are not trying to make a story that they're then going to put out into the world and try to convince other people to look at it. If that is the case and you are, a, let's say a consumer or prosumer and you want to try doing stories, it's not necessarily critical that you do a ton of research on your, on your, you could just go into the world working and start shooting. I'm waiting for this to catch yeah, up. Yeah, there you go. I think there we go. I think, think you're back there. And the other half of people, I don't know why this is taking up because I normally have such, I've, my phone works amazingly well. I'm on these calls all week, so it's weird that it's freezing up. But yeah. the other half of the people are people who are considering putting this work out into the world. Is this working or should I wait? No, I think you're good. Yeah, you're good again. It just, it just, you know, it just happens and it goes away. So we're okay. So the other half is for people who actually want to put this work out into the world. And if that's the case, if you're putting your work out on the table and saying, I, th I think this is important and I want you to look at this, or you're even trying to approach the industry of photography and saying, I want to get this published or, you know, I want to be known, then you owe it to yourself. You owe it to the people in your photographs and you owe it to photography to do your research. And this is a topic that terrifies a lot of people because one, they just don't want to do research. They don't want to be bothered. A lot of people want to think that they've done something original. And the easiest way to do that is just ignore anything else that's ever been done. So you think to yourself, wow, I'm probably the first person that's ever done this. And then you do, you do a little research and all of a sudden you realize you're not the first. And that can be kind of a, a sobering feeling, but it's absolutely fine. And the vast majority of stories that are being done today have already been done, but the person doing them today is building in something new right. or get, providing a new perspective or saying, look, I know this has been done before, but this is where I fit in. And this is the context of what the work I'm doing now is. And so, again, if you're not doing this professionally, if you don't have any interest, then you can you know, you don't necessarily need to do all this, but if you are trying to be a photographer, it's critical. Absolutely. And just knowing, you know, also the research is knowing the environment you're going into, 
will help you understand how to approach this. And you can not only see what other people have done, but what to expect when you get there, right, Dan? Yeah, I mean, doing research is, one, I think it's actually quite fun. It's yeah. one of the best parts of doing a project because you're, odds are you're gonna learn quite a few things. It also makes the photography easier because it gives you more ammo to work from you know, if I'm doing a project in southern New Mexico and I've researched, if I'm doing a project on the militias in southern New Mexico, um, the tangential stories to that are migration, borders. And then when you talk about migration, you talk about things like the reintroduction of the Mexican gray wolf into the border areas. Well, the gray wolf's been migrating through there for forever. It was humans who put a put a fence up, made a border there. And suddenly this arbitrary line is like, hey, there's a border here. Well, the wolves have been migrating through there forever. People have been migrating through there forever. So even if I'm doing a story on the militias, I've got all these tangential angles that are coming in. And the more I research on that, the more ammunition I have to work those into the story I'm doing. Boom. That was three. That was three. Number four. Numero cuatro. Can. There we are. Cuatro. A story is not a portfolio and a portfolio is not a story necessarily. So if you are someone who is used to walking around and what I would call swinging for the fence, hitting like single image home runs, um, doing a story is gonna be a very different experience because a story is often not comprised of 10 outstanding singular images a story is comp comprised of images that tell a narrative yeah and oftentimes that requires you to photograph things <clears throat> and include things in a story that may not be aesthetically pleasing but they're very important informationally to to allow the viewer to understand the story it could be a detail it could be a portrait it could be a photograph of a document it could be an, a photograph of a mailbox that gives you an address. All of these little pieces, I call them transitional files. Yeah. These transitional files that link one aspect of a story to the next. And sometimes they're amazing visual images and sometimes they're not. Take a look at National Geographic. You know, historically that's an, a, 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 obviously a photo heavy magazine, but there's plenty of images in that magazine that are what I would call informational images that are scattered in with the home runs that the photographer has made. Yeah. You know, if you take a photographer like, I don't know, um, anyone that shoots a very visually sophisticated photograph, if you put 20 of those in a National Geographic spread, I don't think that audience is gonna respond to that, you know, because the National Geographic audience is older. A lot of them have been reading that publication and have been around that organization for decades. And you know some of this new, hot, hip, super sophisticated visual stuff does not play in that crowd. Right. Whereas you know some of those images may play on something like TikTok or Instagram, but you know going into a store, a magazine that is about long form documentary content requires a different style of photograph. I mean, historically, the covers of the National Geographic are very, very basic photographs. They're very strong, but they're very basic. And that's because they're trying to tell stories. And that's a totally different thing. So think story, not portfolio necessarily. You can pull a portfolio from your story, but oftentimes if you're going to print a magazine or a book or something, you've got to really include a lot of other kinds of images. You know, there's a flip side to that too, Dan. I, I do a lot of critiquing, and, and one of the comments I'll make is this to me, it looks like a transitional image. It's not a standalone image. And it doesn't stand by itself as a strong image because it, it would work fine if you saw what came before it and what came after it. But that's something you got to think about. Does this singular image stand by itself? Or is it really part of a bigger story? And you, ha you have to differentiate those two things because they don't, you can't switch one to the other. You got you to know what you're doing on that. Yeah, I mean, I think you have to, sometimes you get lucky and you get a standalone image out of the blue, right? You're in the right place, right time, right moment, right light, right composition, right timing, and you, you get it. Those yeah. happen a few times a year at best. 
So you're always starting sort of wide and you're walking your way in. So I think when you're doing stories like this, you put yourself in an environment where you know you can make your style of photograph. That's step one. Step two is you wait for the right light. You, you see the pieces moving on the board in front of you and you start to compose that in the way that you see the world, not the way someone else does, not the way Instagram tells you to take the photographs, none of that. You've got to figure out who you are, how you see. So again, you've put yourself in an environment where something's happening. You've, gained, you've gotten access, you're in the right light, you're starting to compose things. Now you're looking for those home run images. That's what I'm doing is I'm looking for a home run image from every scenario, but oftentimes it's not there. So you're covering, 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 making and making images of what is there, hoping that this home run thing is going to come along. And, you know, the better, the more you practice, the better you get at looking at how pieces are moving in front of you, the more likely you are to get a home run style image. But it's hard. I mean, you know, I went to the last time I went in the field to really work on a project was a couple of years ago. And, you know, I worked, I shot for probably two weeks and, you know, there's a couple of. Well, Dan is catching up. I'm going to, I want to call something to your guys' attention here. What he just said in less than five minutes, maybe three minutes, we could comprise a whole course on this, putting yourself in the right location getting into the right light, looking for the home run, all those things, you know, that's a drill. This is, this, is, uh, th this is how to become an amazing photographer. If you can literally just take, we should transcribe that, Dan, because what you said in a few words is an entire approach to photography that you guys can hone in on and develop. Are we back here in the... Let's see if we can hear you now. Uh, we lost your audio, and um, but I did want to make a, I did want to underscore what you just said here because you guys, all of us, think back when you have done those things, when you have actually put yourself in the right place, you've looked at the light, you've watched. I love what you said, Dan. Watch the pieces coming together because it is like a jigsaw puzzle. I mean, that's the whole thing with composition is you can see something happening. Somebody's moving towards you with their camera. I think we're going to have Dan recall in. So I'll keep commenting on this. There he is. And just work on those points. I'm going to assign you. There you go. Dan, let's hope that does it. You're back there. Jared is back with us. Say something, Dan. Am I back? You're back. Okay, good. Well... You know, it is snowy outside, so no wonder the Internet is freezing up a little bit. It's cold, right? And that affects, we all know that affects the Internet. Anyway, it's I... It's cold, and I, got, and I got a scam call that came in from somewhere, and it just, oh, wonderful. my phone just went haywire. It just flipped out. But anyway, okay. yeah, that's the deal, Dan. What you just said, we could make a whole workshop out of those four or five steps that you brought up. Just remember that. We probably should do that. Yeah, I mean, that's sort of the enemy. You know, if you're going to do a project, don't just wander around aimlessly doing a project. For example, if I was going to do a project with militias in southern New Mexico, I would obviously reach out to the militias in southern New Mexico I don't, and try to talk to them and try to find out where they're going to be and try to set up access and to explain to them exactly who I am and what I'm doing and how I work and if they're, if they're interested. My guess is they would say no. And so if I still wanted to do it, I would probably have to figure out when their public appearances were going to be and then sort of stake out those events and see, put myself in a position to make photos. But, you know, pretty much I'm, I'm constantly like setting up situations to photograph. You know, I, there's a, I, I really want to do a story on El Paso. Um, I like the city in general. And two, I love the concept of migration and how you know El Paso has been known as a place of migration for forever you know since the, basically the one of, since the early times of our species you know people have been transitioning through there I really like the city and I spent a fair amount of time in Juarez as well it's been a while since I've been there but I eat there early and I just really transitioned um, between those places but 
I wouldn't just drive to El Paso and wander around. Um, it doesn't, it's not productive enough. Yeah. Get those, get those points visualized, okay. put them in your notebook and then go out. Now we're up to five, right? If I'm counting right. Yeah. Cin- we're on five. Cinco. Yep. Five is, I should put this in all caps because it goes against everything in our culture in our society society and especially it's online culture which is you've got to take your time yeah. you have got to take your time good stories do not come quickly and there is no there's no substitute for time and access the more time the better the work the more access the better the work yeah the less time the less access if you're in a race to shoot and put it online and shoot and put it online. Don't bother. Yeah. Don't even bother trying to do stories. And plus you're going to aggravate everybody that you're photographing because let me just tell you this, no matter what they say, they don't like that. It feels like exploitation when you're shooting and posting and shooting and posting and shooting and posting that has nothing to do with the people in your photographs. And oftentimes, even though they won't tell you to their face behind the scenes, they're like, this is annoying. I feel like this is a promotion campaign for the photographer so yeah if you're addicted to the post then do something else on the side or post the food you're eating or some other thing that you know satisfies scratch scratches that itch you have but don't don't treat your project that so this Good is one. point five sub point a do not do not your project as you go it's a bad idea that that's something that started happening obviously in the back that up dan because we missed we we missed the beginning of what you said there you said do all it came in on do not and then oh do not share your project as you're going ah there you go yeah because it's it waters down the entire idea of what you're doing and it annoys the people in your photographs that you're posting shooting and posting and shooting and posting they don't want that yeah and it and it makes you look like you have no attention span and a project is better when it's released as a whole so sitting there and shooting and posting and shooting and posting is just not a smart idea i know that was counterintuitive uh no, a footnote on that. Everyone is saying. That's really true on the whole creative process, you know? It's like if you're in the middle of writing a story, you, you, don't, you don't start sharing it with anybody. It's not finished. Wait until you have your first draft. Then you have one trusted person maybe look at it at that point. You're not sharing it out with anybody else, though. Isn't that true? I mean, and that's true with photography, filmmaking, it really any creative process. If you start putting it out there too soon, it interrupts your flow. You're going to get feedback that you don't really want at that point. You haven't even finished the project yet. Just just saying, you know. It is I I think it's also a bit insulting to the people in the photographs. Hopefully that came through. Yeah, it did. Yeah, it's just, you know, if you're if you're the subject of of a photographer and that photographer is standing there and shooting and posting and shooting and posting, it's just insulting. Yeah. It just is kind of like it's so dis it just dis, just disconnects you from the experience of being in the project. And great photographers do not do that. They may share a behind the scenes picture or something trivial or inconsequential, but they're not going to dump a third of a project online and then another third and then another third and then expect anyone to pay attention by the time that third third comes out. Yeah. You know, people just don't have that bandwidth anymore. All right. We're up to six, right? All right. Point number six. And that is for those of you who shoot non-living objects, this does not apply. You know, if you're a landscape photographer, if you shoot, you know, abstract imagery, whatever, um, doesn't apply. But the second you add human beings, you have just 
increase your degree of difficulty and time required by about five times what you would if you did not include people. Uh, but I am strongly encouraging you to include in your projects. I think photographing people, um, and it looks like I've been hung up, hung up for here for five but minutes. We're hearing your voice, so that's that's good. You 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 are a little hung up, but we can still okay, hear. Okay, as long yeah, as long as you can hear me, that's fine. I think a lot of times people are afraid to photograph people, and they're also afraid to photograph strangers. And I get it; it can be awkward, um, especially today when people assume that what you're doing is some slippery thing that may be not on the up and up or they assume that you are shooting and posting all the time people don't like that yeah so it can be you, you can hear no a lot of people you know hey can i can i photograph you no and then you talk to them a little bit longer they figure out what you're doing and they go oh okay well i get this now it's a project all right yeah cool you can photograph me and so humans basically increase your degree of difficulty but i do think it really separates the best photographers from the middle of the pack because if you can if you can work around people you don't know in all kinds of different environments and oh by the way the, a perfect example of this is a documentary that's now on apple plus that's called choice of weapon hmm. about war parks and about what say that again the first african-american photographer of weapon yeah. Whoop, we're, we got a little hung up there. Well, Dan, a documentary on Apple Plus Choice of Weapons. Okay, good. So we will check that out as an example. And well, it's Dan, Gordon, there, you, there you are. It's Gordon, Gordon Parks. Gordon Parks, amazing it's still a, photographer yeah, and this, filmmaker. I hate this hang up. Yeah. It keeps, yeah, Gordon Parks. You know, African American, first African American photographer at life. And He's amazing. The guy worked in every environment imaginable. Yep. And, the and became point, an amazing filmmaker, too. I mean, really fantastic. Writer, composer, yeah, filmmaker, composer, wow. photographer, cultural icon. Super talented. Yeah. Yeah. That's rare. To say the least. So we're up to number seven now. Final point. This, this is the last one. Okay. Number seven is forget fame and just enjoy the experience. Um, for some reason, and I think we can all guess why, uh, I run into people all the time who are obsessed with becoming known or building a following or getting likes, and they are not happy people. And a lot of times the people around them are not happy because they're driving everyone crazy. Uh, you often, if you do that, if you go down that spectrum, you're trying to get famous too fast. You can ruin the experience of being a photographer. So just relax, enjoy the earth, forget fame. The work is very, very good. It will find the fame will find it. You've got to make great work. Oh, uh, do we have you there, Dan? I think Dan is uh, coming back in. Uh, and while we have that, uh, I just wanted to, um, you know, uh, <laughs> uh, Dan is very right about that. Um, you, you see it all the time that a lot of the people who are on YouTube and stuff, you know, it's the same thing for them. The people that are constantly um, only concerned with getting famous are often some of the most miserable people. You know, you see it with rock stars, all kind of professions. So it, you need to just enjoy what you're doing. And oftentimes those are the people that succeed the best. Uh, Mark should be back here. He had to step away for a quick second. Um, in the meantime, uh, I wanted to do a little bit of a shout out. If you are enjoying the show, be sure to give it a like and subscribe. Uh, and uh, we have a lot of content that we put up every week. 
So be sure to join us for that. We have a video out on Saturday, and we do these live streams on Thursday. Um, we should have Mark coming back here soon, and he can let Dan back into the call. Um, and if you guys have questions, be sure to ask them. I'm not sure if we're going to be able to get to too many questions today because uh, of the technical difficulties. It's okay, whoopsie daisy. Hey, we Mark, get our I think you have Dan gotta, back here. Yeah, you Hang on, folks. Back in. Thanks for being patient. We had a little good. technical difficulty, chatting. but we've got Dan back with us. Yep, I've just been chatting with chat. <laughs> okay, well, let's... Like Let's add our friend Dan back in here, and there you are, Dan. Okay, boom. As if by magic. I I do Zoom calls all day long, and I never have this problem, so I don't yeah. know what's going on. Whatever. Okay. Keeps us on our toes. So did you finish point seven? I think so. Okay. Uh, yeah, forget fame. Enjoy the experience. Awesome. So we have some time for some questions. Jared, have you been tracking? I saw one flying by a moment ago. Oh, here we are. Where do you see videography and still photography coming together in a photo essay project? This is right there. Great question. Um, this, ha this requires a little backstory. Um, if you go back to the 90s uh, in the journalism world, we were all told that video would save all of us, that journalists would be, every still photographer would be shooting video and that the public demanded multimedia content. The truth is that was not the truth. And the newspaper industry burned an entire decade and spent literally hundreds of millions of dollars trying to convert newspapers into multimedia. When in fact, what people wanted was just good journalism. Yeah. And simple, still strong photographs were as way more powerful, way less expensive. And it's impossible to give a journalist three or four or five tasks at the same time and expect them to do great work. And I think that reality has continued today where I'm on oftentimes now as a as a creative, I'm on the hook. And, and Baja last week was a great example. Um, I was on the hook for recording video, shooting stills, recording sound, and writing all at the same time. And I can tell you after looking through all the work, there's not very much really good work in that, that week of work because I'm trying to do four or five things at one time. That is not fair for anyone, but it has now become accepted and somewhat the norm to expect people to do all those things. I don't know anyone who really does all of those things at the same time really well. I know a lot of young filmmakers who are amazing at making cinematic content, but do not know how to tell a story. I know a lot of great still photographers who have completely watered down their still work because they're now trying to do video and stills. And oh, by the way, with video, your audio is about 50% of the equation. If you do not have great sound, yeah. it doesn't matter what you did on video. So it's really hard. I don't think this is ever going to change and go back in the other direction. I think it's only going to get worse and, and maybe not worse is probably the wrong word, but I think multimedia content is going to become more and more and more common. I think motion content is really dominating right now. Um, but if you, if you're a still photographer, just start out just by making stills and taking notes. Just start there. And then if you get to the point where you feel very, very comfortable with that, you could also start maybe to record some audio because you can, you can hit play on an audio recorder or hit record and just go about your business and let it record. It's not like it's going to take a massive amount of concentration just to be recording things like ambient sound. But, um, you know, I'm still a huge fan of print. I think photography is a great, is a story um, that is absolutely tailor-made for print where you don't need sound. You just need great stills and great copy and you've got yourself a project. That's still how I prefer to consume photography. You know, I don't look at photography online for the most part. I wait for it to come out in print because I know what it takes to get something into print. 
and the amount of time and attention and consideration that things get when they go into print is at, at a whole nother level beyond the web. And so, yeah, multimedia is fun. I mean, I've, I've had a lot of fun trying to learn how to do motion, but I, it's also taken away from the quality of my still photographs. Okay, we got another one here. And, and you know, a number of photographers did make that transition. We, we were just talking about uh, uh, Parks. And then, of course, Jimmy Chin has gone from a still photographer to, a cin you know, really making pretty amazing films. So you yeah, can I mean, definitely do that. And look at, um, you know, you have, you have movie directors like Luc Besson. Luc Besson was a still photographer. And the first time I ever saw a film of his, a film called The Big Blue, the first thing I thought when I saw it was this, this looks like still photographs. Exactly. That are, that, you know, so, there's something, the guy, whoever made this is definitely knows his way around a still camera. Um, you know, yeah, Jimmy Chin's a good example, but there's a lot now, you know, a lot of people who have transitioned over. But I also think it's the changing of that narrow gauge of photography itself. You know, I think when Jimmy started, the outlets for photography were very narrow. You know, we didn't have social, you didn't have the internet. He was primarily an athlete first. He's a skier and a climber. That's how I knew Jimmy Chin before he was a photographer as I, you know, the climbing and the skiing part. Yeah. Um, and now all of a sudden, you know, I wouldn't necessarily call, he, to me, he's like a general creative now. He's yeah. a director, he's a filmmaker, he's a still photographer. He can do all these other things. I think that's very interesting, but, um, also, I'm guessing, I don't know him, but a lot of the work he's doing now is with teams of creatives. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So there's no question think, about that. He's transitioned to a completely different level. of. Yeah. I think a lot of good filmmakers know you've got to delegate. You know, you've got sound people, you've got editors, you've got producers, you've got camera people. And I think sometimes we're, we're fooled into looking at little YouTube clips or something and saying, oh, I can, I'll go do that. Yeah. And then you, you know, you look at the credits on the YouTube clip and you're like, wow, there's 10 people involved in that, that production. So, you know, you can only do so much as an individual. And I think you have to pick your battles. Dan, we got time for a couple more questions. Here's one from Stuart. This is stretched across the screen. Can you read it? Uh, you talk about the time needed, but travel writers such as Paul Thoreau, uh, can seemingly go on a train journey and still create books full of faces and voices. Is there a photographic way of doing this? Yeah, I, I really like, I like Thoreau. I actually met him accidentally once on a beach in Hawaii. He was sitting there writing on a yellow legal pad in a, in a beach chair in the surf. Um, wow. and I said to myself, that kind of looks like Paul Thoreau. No, that can't be Paul Thoreau. It was Paul Thoreau. Um, you know, writers have an advantage because they don't necessarily have to be there. Right. You know, as a writer, I, I worked when I worked in journalism, there were plenty of times where I'm out in the field, you know, w making pictures. I'm at fires. I'm at floods. I'm all this. The re sometimes the, re the reporters wouldn't leave the building. They would write these stories based on phone calls they made to whether it was public information officers, whether it was people who lived in the area. They didn't have to go. And so... To me, writing is actually the high art. I, pu I put writing above photography. That's just me personally, because writing fascinates me because let's just say, for example, everybody on this call has, has access to approximately the same vocabulary, right? Let's say that we all came from a background that provided that to us. But if, if, we all, if Jared and Mark and I all write stories about an event, they're all going to be completely different. And that's what I love about writing is that writing is like, and Stephen King calls it telepathy, where he can put something into writing and get that viewer to think about something in a very specific way. Yeah. Um, Thoreau can do a train journey and write, write a book from that. The difference is with photography, you've got to be there. There's no, you cannot fabricate a passage. You cannot you know, basically scheme up something that you think you have to be in the field. You have to make those pictures in, in real time. Now, video is a little bit different. Motion content to me is very interesting because for me personally, it feels like the opposite of still photography. With still photography, 99.9% .9 of what goes down 
is right in the field and you have a fraction of a second to get that. In fact, you have to predict that it's going to happen. If you're using a camera with a mirror in it, if you see the image, you missed it because that mirror is supposed to black out the second that that, that that image happens. So think about the fraction of a second that you have to capture. Everything for me, all the cards are played in the field. Video is different because video to me, motion content, the art form is what happens in the studio afterwards in the editing bay. Yeah. Because Absolutely. you cast such a different net with video, with motion, you're, you're shooting 10 times the amount of motion content for what you're going to use. And you're just throwing this huge net out there. And then in the editing bay, when it's done, and this is where great film editors come in, um, you see what a great editor does. I think one of the, one of the best things to do with studying motion is to find a movie that you love and study the trailers that were made from that movie. Mm -hmm. That's where good editing comes in, where a good movie trailer to me is, a, is an art form in itself. And so I think, you know, writing and, and photographing, all of this stuff just takes copious amounts of time. I mean, when I started in photography, the average assignment time was exponentially longer than it is now. Nobody's assigning people the way they were. And consequently, you see so much average work, even in publications that historically were astoundingly good. I've lost interest in most of the publications out there because they just don't put the time in. They don't want to pay. They don't want, you know, they claim they don't have the budget to send people on assignments for any length of time. And consequently, the work doesn't look very good. So that's why I love photography books, because if someone has the fortitude to put a book into the world these days, then especially through like a traditional book publisher, that doesn't happen by accident. There's a lot of thought and a lot of time and a lot of money and a lot of people involved in those projects. So when a book, I mean, I just got Gilles Perez's new book on Northern Ireland and it comes with a little printing insert. And I mean, that thing is mind blowing. And, and it's not just the time that he put in to make the pictures, but it's the team that put this book together. You know, I'm not interested in seeing that work online. I want to see it on the printed page in a thought out photo book. Absolutely. Dan, listen, I want to thank you for taking time out. You are one busy dude and you're traveling and I really appreciate your taking time to give us your wisdom on these on these key points as far as telling stories. Any last thought you want to leave these guys with? The my last thought is it looks like the, the uh, I'm not hanging up anymore. It looks like it finally worked. The finally, we, we, totally we worked fine, at, but, Well, uh, it must have warmed up a little bit. That wasn't freezing the internet so much. But thank you again, yeah, Dan. Just, you know, ha have fun. Yeah. Ha have fun with this stuff. It's, I think the people you're photographing are going to, they're going to feel how you feel without you having to say anything. If you walk into a scene and you're, uptight or you're aggressive or you're pushy or you're in a hurry people don't really respond to that you have to just go in and say look I, this is a long-term project i'm going to take my time i'm going to try some new things i'm going I'm to spend a lot of time talking to people just to get access and explain what i'm doing and i'm going to build this project one photograph at a time i'm going to take notes carry my little journal with me and I'm going to, I'm really going to enjoy this. And I tell you what, when you start going back and sharing what you've done with the people that you photographed, that is a life changing moment because for a lot of them, it's life changing as well. And the, it gives them a completely different perspective on who you are and what you're doing than if you're posting on something like social and they may or may not see it or, you know, it's just a fleeting thing. But when you come back with prints, and you start showing people like, hey, this is what I'm working on. And, you know, this is the story. And this is how you fit in. And look at this image I made of you. All of a sudden, they feel like they're part of what you're doing. Awesome. Dan, thanks again. And uh, we've got more questions. We, we're going to have to have you come back so we can answer those other questions. But stay right warm. Thanks, thanks. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Jared. We'll see you again next time, Dan. Thank you. Awesome. Yeah, we'll see you As later. Always fun to have Dan on. I mean, you guys should unpack this. Everything he said could be a whole course, could be a whole workshop for sure. So my advice is listen to this, watch this video again, because you don't want to miss any of those points that he made. Very strong points. And this is super important stuff as far as 
developing yourself as a photographer, and it is a developmental process. Okay, well, thank you guys for your other questions, and you know we will try to have Dan back. He's a busy guy, but we'll try to fit him in soon. Appreciate you guys joining us from all over the world. And don't forget, if you haven't already done so, please hit the subscribe button and enable the bell because you don't want to miss our other shows coming up here. And uh, head on over to Bay Photo because I want you guys to get some prints. You heard what Dan said. Get prints. Make prints. So important. You know, the real stuff of photography is when it... When we go back to the basic of printing and putting it on a piece of paper, putting it on the wall, showing it to people in a book or whatever. But, you know, online is such a scratching the surface of what the, the real art form is here called photography. Thank you, guys. Once again, thank you, thank you, thank you. Be sure to like, leave your comments on this because we do read them. If you like this video enough, you should share it with your friends. I'm not kidding. There's a lot of wisdom in here. Let them know about it. And don't forget, before I say this, Jared, do we have any anything I've missed? Anything we need to go over before we sign off here? I uh, guess Jared's not there. Okay, well, fine. <laughs> so last but not least, and you guys can say this with me, is remember to get out and capture your own images of life. Love you guys. Stay warm, creative, and we'll see you again soon.